Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about the state of game development. Uh, I uh, am the CEO of M2 Research. We do a lot of research more on the developer side of the community in terms of uh, tech and technology, so what developers are doing, trends, and um, what platforms. Um, so I don't know if you caught Patrick's presentation right before mine, but it's actually a beautiful segue into what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> so what we do, we consult. Um, we do a lot of work with companies with their marketing positioning and strategy. We communicate with trends and we do, you know, state of industry analysis and we connect. We do, we're doing more in the networking um, uh, side of things, uh, especially with developers. So what, what I've done is, um, this past year we've done a series of surveys. Uh, we've surveyed almost 4,000 developers uh, internationally um, through several different surveys. One is a uh, technology survey that we did, and the other one is a survey that we did with uh, the IGDA to look at satisfaction in the industry, how satisfied are developers. So some of the data is going to be from the developer technology survey, and some of it's going to be from the satisfaction survey. But they line up really, really well, and it's some interesting data. So the changing landscape: we have growth of indies is obviously the big, the big thing. The changing complexity of content, and Patrick showed us how the genres are are breaking out. We have development issues and diversity. So the growth of the indies. Um, you know, what I like to do is look across different media formats. If we look at the film industry, back in 1919 was when um, Douglas Fairbanks and a group of actors actually uh, got together to form uh, an, uh, an association to help actors. Um, and if we look across the board to the music industry in the 1950s is when we, we really started to see the indie music take off and in the 70s they, they started the uh, National Association for Independent Record dis Distributors. And it, in the games industry we're still so new, um, you know, I really sort of tag it to the early 2000s with Unity and in 2005 we had Indiecade that started and obviously Casual Connect is just exploded. Um, in 2010 in the film industry 42 percent of box office revenues came from indie titles which is really telling you know and in the music industry we had 510 percent growth in, in indie musicians making their living. Um, and and in the games industry, I think we're still in this struggling stage. You know, how do we move? How do we move it forward? In in 2008, I said that you know we had a lot of layoffs. People were actually using their severance packages to start game companies. Um, there were a lot of people starting mobile game companies and social game companies, and it was hard, and it's still hard. But I think we're just you know we're moving very quickly to an industry that um, has a lot of opportunity and growth. So this is part of our research that we, that we, um, that we did. We asked um, the industry, you know, what type, describe your company. If you look, all of the pink to red is indie. So the, the very top, the lightest pink, those are part-time hobbyists. Then you've got individual freelancers, full-time indies. The dark is studios that are made up of um, indies with between two and 24 people. The blue are studios and publishers, and the green are other service um, uh, and support and media. But what's interesting is over time, we've had this hobbyist. I used to call it the prosumer because they were m they weren't consumer. They were making some of their living off of their hobby, and it's really 
grown over time. And what is interesting too is I don't know if you caught um, Gama Sutra just came out with their survey results for their their salary survey results that they did last week. And what that data showed was that if you are an independent indie, you're making eleven thousand dollars a year. But if you are with a studio, small studio, so that the red section, or you know, a full-time indie with some other um, company, their the revenue shot up 161 percent to fifty thousand dollars a year, and that correlates with our data too. That we found that, you know, a lot of the indies are making about. 250,000, so if you, a team of five, that's pretty much what it's uh, boiling down to. So that's the breakout. Why are they going to Indy? You know, because there's, you know, with, when you're with a publisher, you have security and you have resources, but it outweighs the creative control of being Indy and working in small teams and having, being involved from the entire process. That's what we're finding when we talk to Indies. It's like, it's more than just a cultural shift. It's, it's that ability to be part of a process all the way through. And we ask them, what are, what are the reasons that you became independent? And 58% is they wanted more control over their working conditions. Uh, they wanted to make the games that they wanted to make and they wanted to have control over their content. So looking at content, and this goes back to Patrick's data, if uh, this is kind of interesting if you saw his, his uh, slides. So this is data from Inmobi. Um, it's a little bit light, but basically the dark blue is American gamers, then Chinese gamers, and Korean gamers. So if you look across the genres, you've got strategy, RPG, adventure, sim, puzzle, social, and casino what's popping out here uh, you know there is a difference in what people play depending on what country they're in so if you l then if you look at when i when we asked developers what type of games they were making this is what they came back with action adventure puzzle arcade um it's a little bit interesting so so going back to then if you look You've got the action adventure are almost half is what they're focused on. You go back to, in Moby's data, adventure in the US is only 24%. But yes, 50% of developers are saying that that's the kind of game that they're making. You look at puzzle in the US and it's 45%. You go back to, back to, well, if you go to puzzle here, it's 31%. So there's, th there seems to be a disconnect between the consumer and the developer. Um, look at casino and esports, which everyone seems to be talking about, and they're only, you know, the developers, there's 7 and 5% uh, are developing games for, for those genres. So then it takes us to development. So what's going on in the development space? What platforms are developers actually developing for? So this is interesting. Tablet, obviously. Android. PC online. And um, Steam. Now, what's interesting about this is when I asked them the question, what are you developing for now? What are you developing for in 12 months? Uh, uh, iOS, both iPad and, and iPhone, everything iOS drops significantly. What starts, um, what takes, takes a big, bigger growth hit is Android tablet and Steam. Steam just bumps up. And you can see this from, from the next piece of data on distribution. Where do you distribute your products? This is also really interesting. In 12 months, look at Steam currently 10%. Th that's going to double from what the developers are saying, which makes total sense. That's what it, it's the developers are finding it very difficult to 
to make an impact um, on the mobile uh, platforms. And a lot of them are telling me that if they move, if not even move, but if they also add steam, they actually create additional revenue that then they can use to, to build out some of the other platforms. So looking at development, so what I, I've been in the industry for a while. I really was tracking 3D graphics technologies in the mid 90s. And what I find fascinating is here we are, we're in VR world again. Um, you know, this is a picture of Nicole Stenger, who in, this is from 1992, she was an artist and a fellow at MIT. And she was creating um, VR experiences from an artistic perspective. And I don't know if you're familiar, but the, systems and the tools that were used at that time cost millions, multi-millions of dollars to, to do anything um, interesting. Today, what we have, we've got Unity and Unreal that have de democratized the tools. The, when we asked developers if they were interested in developing for VR, 8% have said yes. And, and then, of course, cloud gaming is, is, I think, going to be very interesting in the future. Um, a good example of uh, of what's happening in VR in the VR space is Paul Batner. I don't know if you know who he is. He was um, words with friends, and now he's got uh, a company called Playful, and they have this title called Lucky's Tale, which is a kind of a, a, a kids game. Um, they were able to do a demo, a VR demo for Oculus. Um, in three days using Unity and Asset um, in the Asset Store. They were able to get almost a full working um, version of the game in four months with less than 20 people on their team. So the, the last area that I really wanted to touch on was diversity. You know, this goes back to this discrepancy in genres um, in terms of what people are playing, and it goes back to Patrick's data that showed this mass market. Uh, and I've, I've been to a lot of s conferences and sessions where we hear mass market and then the disconnect of a shooter. And I'm like, well, a shooter isn't really mass market. Um, so how do we how do we address that? I mean, what is going on with diversity in the games industry? And if we look at the articles every day, I see more and more articles about you know, diversity issues. Uh, and it's 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 a, a big for me. It's a it's a big um, component. So this and this comes from our IGDA satisfaction data. In terms of men to women, the games industry is still obviously um, pretty weighted towards men. Um, Casual Connect is unique in that, that it's got a, a really great number of women in it. There's going to be a women's luncheon after my session that I'm really excited to go to. And if you women, if you don't know about it, you should all go. <laughs> um, and, uh, but we still have a ways to go. You know, if you look at the film industry, again, I like to do these comparisons. The film industry, it's quite interesting that there's such a correlation. Producers make up the biggest percentage of the film industry, almost 25%. And in the games industry, it's not far behind. Where we're lacking, as in the film industry, is the more technical areas, you know, the, the programmers and, in the film industry, it's choreographers, but um, it, it's still got a ways to go. So w when we asked about diversity, 79% of the industry actually believe it's important to the industry, and 74% felt it was important to the workplace. So how do we, 
and I don't have an answer for this, how do we as an industry m move us forward um, to better capture some of, some of this? And then we asked the factors influencing society's negative perception of the industry. So first off is working conditions. You know, and, and that goes back to why people want to be indies. They're tired of the crunch. They're tired of uh, you know, not having incentives because they actually love what they do. And then we have sexism in games is 67% is close behind. Perceived violent link in games. Sexism in the workforce perceived link to obesity and lack of overall diversity. So those are the negative perceptions of the industry that came through. So the future outlook. Obviously the, the growth of indies is, is key and I think what we need to do is um, we need to build up and support the indie community uh, and I, that means through better funding sources, better marketing, better, um, just better overall ecosystems. Um, and content focus more on the expansion of the genres, gameplay, storytelling. These breakout games are what, you know, what even what Patrick showed before, you know, with Kim Kardashian, these are, these are just, y you can't predict where they're going to come from, but you have to just do what you have some passion for and do some testing, and, and I think we're going to see some really interesting types of games going forward. And development, it's just, everything is changing, you know, in terms of development and platforms, and um, it's all shifting. And then, obviously, we need more develop, we need more diversity, and that is what's also going to help us sustain the market. So thank you. That's that's my presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, questions? Yeah. Oh. Uh, time frame of the of the survey. Well, there are two separate surveys, but the um, it was February through. Uh, June of this year. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, I also missed the first couple of minutes of this presentation, so, uh, but there's a slide there about where are developers focusing on uh, the, in the next 12 months, mm -hmm. and you pointed out that Steam is a big, um, big area. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you have any more context as to why they they are moving to, to o away from the current. I don't know. Because it's just the, the they're not. There's no opportunity. You mean why they're moving away from like the the more traditional mobile platforms? Is because there's no. They're having a hard time getting discovered. The discoverability is is an issue. So if you're an indie, um, you can actually release games on Steam um, and and you know, even unfinished, get, it's, e what I've been hearing from indies is that they can, in a week on Steam, get $50,000, and that helps fund some of the other platforms that they're trying to do. So that some, sometimes it, it doesn't even have to be a completed version. It just gives them a little more flexibility, and then they can actually do tie-ins to their mobile version. Thank you. Um, I went to a session yesterday about the consolidation of the games industry and about um, sort of the frenzy of M&A activity happening. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear how you think that coexists with what you're saying about the you know, explosion of indies, because I think they do, they do make sense together, but it seems like there's some sort of tension. So I'd yeah. be curious to hear how you think about that. Yeah, no, I, it, it's, it's hard. It, and it, it goes back to the film industry, too. I mean, there is that the, the 
things that, that get funded um, are generally these big budget, big production, um, sequel type um, films. Mm -hmm. What And what we need more attention on in terms of funding is looking at some of these, these indie developers and how can we support them you know, even outside of the current um, models that we have with crowdfunding opportunities, I, I think we need to find more creative ways to support the indie community. Uh, and because it doesn't, it's still growing. Yeah, because it's still okay. growing, and it doesn't really, it doesn't really show up yet on the the you know the the M and A activities that's happening. I, I, if you're in M and A, you don't really want to. To, you want to have some success, and an indie, they've, they may have success, but they're still building up their studio. So it, it's hard. I mean, it, I, I think there are going to be some, some new models for funding that we haven't seen yet. Do you, like, what, what, are there any kinds in particular that are coming to mind? Or? Well, I mean, I, 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 I've talked to a lot of the, the incubators, and I don't think the incubator model has worked well. So... I'm not sure. It's a combination of investing in teams and um, maybe individual titles f versus a whole, like, a whole studio, per se. And, I, and I, I don't know. I'm not quite sure how that's going to pan out yet. Thank you. One more question here. Thank you for your talk. It was, um, it was great. Oh, Lots of information. Learned a lot. Um, just a quick question. I've been a, I've been to uh, a few of the other talks around, especially to the publishers' um, sessions, because I was curious to see how an indie developer could partner up with big name publishers and things like that. And what was disheartening to see and hear back was that most of them had these cutoff points at you know one million uh, DAUs or MAUs, and these were numbers that we couldn't an, an ordinary indie developer couldn't you know, aspire to, I mean, yes, if it was the best of all situations considered, mm -hmm. that could happen. So, um, what, what could you tell an indie developer when they're in this kind of a situation where you don't know where to go for funding and most of the traditional funding resources that are available are just not, uh, not a fit for you? Right, I know. And you just can't make it. What do you do? You just give up and say goodbye? <laughs> I, I know, it's... To me, it's it's heart wrenching because um, I l love the the indie s scene f for any type of media, really. So, um, you know, I mean, and if you look, and so what I'm trying to do right now is look at what is it that make the br the indies that are breakouts successful. And I think what it boils down to is their a bit of their team and a bit having a production process that they can iterate quickly. You know, you know, like if you if you look at Rovio, I mean, they were about to give up, and they really were about to just close up shop. And they, because they had failed so many times, they actually had a process to iterate quickly on new ideas. And I think that for for an indie, perhaps we don't have that process set up. And I, th I so. What I'd like to see is how do we build out the steps to to quickly iterate o multiple times to to find a, a hit that will you know get some revenue generating quickly. Okay. Well, any thanks last, very much. Any last questions? Yep. I just had a quick question about, I thought it was interesting that you compared the uh, current push towards VR to the past uh, pushes, and I think you're exactly right that, you know, the tools are more democratized, a little bit more accessible. But we haven't seen, I feel like we've seen a lot of prototypes and not a lot of successes mm -hmm. yet. Do you think that the changes to the VR scene will make a different result this time around, or is it sort of the same thing that we'll see, whereas a lot of cool prototypes, not a lot of actual consumer products? Well, no, I, I think we're going to see consumer products. I don't know that they're all going to be games. That's what I think. I think there's going to be a lot of more educational training applications um, 
that, that's my feeling. Even if you looked at the chart that had um, a breakout for um, genre, I, I, I go out and I ask about branded games, serious games, uh, and those were all on that chart because I think um, it's all one big, for me, it's one big ecosystem. So um, you could be doing um, a, a training game um, for, you know, an, an enterprise training game. Um, and to me, that falls, falls into the, the whole um, ecosystem. Thank you very much. Awesome job. <laughs> Thanks Appreciate so much. It.